Now that we've seen how we can combine the 2s and 2p atomic orbitals to make molecular orbitals out of these valence orbitals for the second row elements, in this unit we're going to dig into the homonuclear diatomic molecules and the molecular orbitals of these, building up entire molecular orbital energy diagrams for the homonuclear diatomics. So the goal here really is to kind of find a, a home, find the home address for all the valence electrons in these homonuclear diatomic molecules, molecules like F2, O2, and N2, for example. So throughout this, we're going to be describing and applying the tenets of molecular orbital theory that we've already seen at this point, and we're going to be inferring some things from the molecular orbital energy diagrams. The goal often is not the generation of the molecular orbital energy diagrams per se, but the interpretation of these to get ideas, for example, about the bond order in a diatomic molecule or the magnetic properties, which we'll touch on in this lesson and in the next. All right, let's start with molecular orbital diagrams for the homonuclear diatomic molecules. So these are molecules of the period two elements, B2 through Ne2, boron through neon, diatomic meaning two atoms, right? And so we're looking at two of those atoms linked to each other. Because these are period two elements, the valence atomic orbitals are 2s and 2p. And we see the combinations of the various s and p orbitals drawn on this slide, along with horizontal lines to indicate each orbital. So this is analogous to the atomic orbital energy diagrams that we've seen in the past. Now, there are two sets of diagrams here, and we'll touch on the reason there are two different MO scaffolds for the homonuclear diatomics, with the gap sort of happening between dinitrogen N2 and dioxygen O2. For the time being, really, I want to focus on how the atomic orbitals combine to make molecular orbitals in these molecules. And we're going to, let's start at the bottom as we would when we're filling up these orbitals using the Aufbau principle and talk about the shapes and bonding and anti-bonding properties of each molecular orbital and what it's composed of. So if we start on the outside of each diagram, we'll notice the atomic orbitals. We've got the 2s and 2p orbitals, and for a homonuclear diatomic, these are at equal energies, right, since we've got two copies of the same atom in the molecule. The 2s orbitals are just spherical in shape, and these can overlap either constructively to make a sigma bonding orbital or destructively to make a sigma star antibonding orbital. And you see general shapes for these orbitals in blue with the positions of the nuclei pointed out in purple there. So the bonding orbital, for instance, has large density between the nuclei. By now we're familiar with this as a hallmark of a bonding orbital. The electrons that occupy this orbital are spending most of their time between the nuclei, as we would expect for bonding electrons. The antibonding orbital includes a node between the nuclei, and the electrons occupying this orbital, if it does contain electrons, are mostly actually outside of the region between the two nuclei. In a sense, almost pulling those nuclei apart from each other. With the 2p orbitals, things get a little more complicated because the 2pz orbitals, which were uh, treating here, sorry, the 2px orbitals, which we're treating here as pointed directly at each other along the internuclear axis, these have a different kind of symmetry than the 2py and 2pz, which are perpendicular to the internuclear axis, the line joining the two nuclei. The 2p x orbitals can overlap directly in a head-on fashion to form sigma bonding and sigma antibonding orbitals. And we see that here with the sigma 2p orbital, large electron density between the two nuclei, for instance, and the sigma star 2p, which is up here where we have a node between the nuclei. And I would just draw your attention here to the qualitative similarity between this sigma bonding orbital and this one and this sigma antibonding orbital and this one. The only difference really is that this is made of 2p orbitals. These are made of 2p orbitals, and so they have somewhat different shapes. For example, somewhat larger lobes between the nuclei and the antibonding orbital, and the, the bonding orbital, somewhat larger lobes outside of the nuclei and the bonding orbital, so on and so forth. The p orbitals that are perpendicular to the internuclear axis are going to overlap in a side-on or pi-type fashion to make pi bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals. And this can happen either in the y direction, sort of up and down as we've defined it here, or in the z direction, perpendicular to the screen. And this gives us two sets 
of pi and pi star orbitals. So we have, for instance, the pi 2 py bonding orbital and the pi star 2 py bond antibonding orbital with a node between the nuclei. And we have the pi 2 pz bonding orbital. This is a bit difficult to visualize, but imagine those p orbitals perpendicular to your screen. And the pi star 2 pz antibonding orbital with a node between the nuclei. And this is the energy ordering we observe for B2 through N2. Interestingly, with the pi 2p orbitals lower in energy than the sigma 2p orbitals. So, uh, an idea I want to impart is that this is not normal. Uh, B2 through N2 is very much an abnormal situation uh, when it comes to this energetic ordering. Typically, sigma orbitals are lower energy than pi orbitals. We'll talk about the origins of this anomaly in B2 through N2 on the next slide. For O2 through Ne2, the orbitals are actually exactly the same. If you look at the labels, if you count the types of orbitals, they're exactly the same. And the shapes are exactly the same. I literally copied and pasted to generate these shapes. The only difference is the energetic ordering here. The more normal situation is over here with the sigma 2p orbital lower in energy than the pi 2p orbital, particularly what's showing up here in this orange box is, is very much normal. We generally expect sigma bonding orbitals to be lower in energy than pi bonding orbitals, for instance. All right, so what's the deal with this sort of strange energetic switching of the sigma and pi orbitals in B2 through N2? Well, this is the result of a phenomenon known as SP mixing. And this slide kind of shows you the progression of orbital energies as we go left to right across period two using the energy of the pi 2 p orbital as uh, kind of a baseline, right? And the thing we'll see here is that as we go from Li to Be to boron, carbon, nitrogen, the energy of the sigma 2 p x orbital is decreasing. What happens for these elements of very low electronegativity, lithium, beryllium, boron, and in fact all the way through nitrogen, is that the sigma star orbital here and the sigma orbital here have the same symmetry and are close enough in energy to interact or mix with each other. And this causes a splitting of those two orbitals that ends up elevating the energy of the sigma 2p x orbital above and beyond the energy of the pi 2p orbitals, in fact, so that we get this sort of strange energetic inversion. This is known as sp mixing, and, and the s and the p refer to the 2s orbitals that make up this guy and the 2p orbitals that make up this guy. Mixing between the two sigma orbitals, sigma s and sigma p, causes this splitting and causes the sigma 2p orbital to be abnormally high in energy. As we increase in electronegativity left to right across this series, the 2s and 2p orbitals get separated in energy within the atom. So for oxygen, the gap between s and p is larger than, for example, that gap in carbon, for instance. And as that gap widens, the interaction between the sigma 2s, uh, sigma 2p and the sigma 2s orbitals gets weaker and weaker. And so the sigma 2p orbital starts to kind of approach normal energetic territory below the energy of the pi 2p orbitals. And so O2, F2, this is kind of the more normal situation without sp mixing, where the sigma 2p orbital is, as we'd expect intuitively based on orbital overlap arguments, lower in energy than the pi 2p orbitals. Now that we're familiar with these kind of basic scaffolds, for the molecular orbitals of the homonuclear diatomics, let's look at a couple of examples of generating what we'll call molecular orbital electron configurations for these diatomic molecules. And the idea here is we can write an electron configuration for the homonuclear diatomic molecules just like we could for an atom, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. We can do that same idea with a molecule just using labels like sigma 2s2, sigma star 2s2, and, and so on and so forth. Let's start with the electron configuration and the bond order of diatomic nitrogen, N2. Now the first thing we need to do is make sure we've got the scaffold of molecular orbitals right, thinking about things like sp mixing. If we look at 
in two in its position sort of in this progression of diatomic molecular orbital energies, we see that N2 is significantly affected by sp mixing. This puts the sigma 2p orbital higher in energy than the pi 2p orbitals in that molecule. So the scaffold I'm going to use is going to position that sigma 2p orbital higher in energy than the pi 2p orbitals. All right, good. Now we need to think about how many electrons we need to deal with and we need to fill the molecular orbitals in accordance with the principles for orbital filling that we've seen previously in an atomic context, the Aufbau principle and Hund's rule. Notice here also that we're only dealing with valence atomic orbitals. We don't want to and don't need to and definitely shouldn't account for core electrons when we're filling in these diagrams. What I like to do is, if possible, if, if it's intuitive, is draw a Lewis structure for the diatomic and use the electrons that I see in that Lewis structure as a guideline for how many electrons to put in the molecular orbital energy diagram. So for example, if we look at the Lewis structure of N2, there are 10 valence electrons in this Lewis structure. That means that my molecular orbital energy diagram is going to contain 10 electrons. And in accordance with the outbound principle, I start filling from the bottom up, putting two electrons in the sigma 2s orbital, another pair in the sigma star 2s orbital. The next orbital up is pi 2p, so I add one electron there. In accordance with Hund's rule, I'm going to avoid pairing the next electron and put that in the other pi 2p molecular orbital. The next electron is going to pair up like so, and then the next electron will pair up again to avoid going up to a higher energy level. And then finally, we'll have a pair of electrons in the sigma 2p orbital. And if my math skills serve me right, this is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 electrons. We've accounted for all the electrons in the Lewis structure, and we're done filling. Now we can sort of convert this representation into a molecular electron configuration just by listing the molecular orbitals labels from lowest to highest energy with a superscript indicating the number of electrons occupying that orbital or orbitals with the same label. And we'll see this in a second, but you'll notice that, for instance, we can just list pi 2p with a 4 superscript to indicate that both of the orbitals within the pi 2p, not really subshell, but that same kind of idea, these two degenerate orbitals contain four electrons total. So we would start here with sigma 2s2, two electrons here and then sigma star 2s2. Pi 2p4 is a representation of this entire set of degenerate pi 2p orbitals. And then last but not least, we're going to have sigma 2p2. This is the molecular orbital configuration for diatomic nitrogen. Now, in terms of the bond order, the way we calculate bond order is by first finding the difference between bonding and anti-bonding electrons. So what I'm going to do is just count up the number of bonding electrons that I see. I've got a pair right here in the sigma bonding orbital. I've got two pairs in these pi bonding orbitals, and that is looking good. And then I have one more pair in the sigma 2p bonding orbital. So in total, I've got six bonding electrons. Next up, we're going to subtract the antibonding electrons. And in diatomic nitrogen, my only antibonding electrons are these in the sigma star 2s orbital. That's star indicating an antibonding molecular orbital. So I'm going to subtract those two. And then for each pair of bonding electrons, I have a bond. And so I'm going to divide by two to give an overall bond order of three for this molecule. And the thing to notice here that is both endlessly fascinating to me and consistent with all of the theory of Lewis structures and molecular orbitals is this three matches the number of bonds between the nitrogens in the Lewis structure. This will generally be true. Um, when it doesn't happen, something very weird is going on, and that indicates that there might be a problem with your molecular orbital energy diagram. For the homonuclear diatomics, the number of bonds here and the bond order here based on the MO diagram should nearly always agree. Now let's do the same kind of analysis for diatomic oxygen, O2. At O2, we've crossed over the line where sp mixing is no longer significant. So the ordering of our 
sigma and pi 2p orbitals has changed with the sigma 2p orbital lower in energy than the pi 2p orbital, kind of the normal quote unquote situation. And here again, we want to know what is the MO electron configuration. We're going to fill in this MO diagram. And what's the net bond order? Once again, I would point out that we're only worried about the valence atomic orbitals and the valence electrons. So I can use a Lewis structural representation, which only includes the valence electrons, to give me an idea of how many electrons to put into these orbitals. I could also just use the number of valence electrons in oxygen, multiplying it by two, since my molecule contains two oxygen atoms. But here we can go two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 valence electrons in the O2 molecule. And I'm going to use the Aufbau principle and Hund's rule to fill these up kind of as usual. We've got two, four, six in the sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, and sigma 2p orbitals respectively. And then I'm going to start filling the pi 2p, avoiding pairing in accordance with Hund's rule, but then pairing up when I have to, to avoid going up in energy to the next level. I've got two more electrons left, and Hund's rule says I should avoid pairing these up. So the remaining two electrons will go into these two degenerate sigma star 2p orbitals, avoiding pairing in accordance with Hund's rule. And so now that we've filled everything up, we can write our molecular electron configuration, starting with the lowest energy sigma 2s orbital. That's got two electrons in it. That's this representation right here. Sigma star 2s. We've got sigma 2p. Pi 2p4, representing both of those degenerate pi 2p orbitals. And then pi star 2p2. This sort of obscures the fact that the electrons are unpaired. We don't see that in this molecular electron configuration representation. But the molecular orbital energy diagram makes that abundantly clear. The Lewis structure suggests a bond order of two in the diatomic molecule. There's no indication of these unpaired electrons, which is interesting. The Lewis structural formalism can't tell us that there are unpaired electrons in the structure. Only the molecular orbital diagram can do that. But we find bond order here from the molecular orbital diagram, just as we did for dinitrogen, counting up the number of bonding and antibonding electrons, finding their difference, and then dividing by two. So here I see two four, six, eight bonding electrons in sigma and pi bonding orbitals. And I see two, four anti-bonding electrons. Dividing that difference by two tells me that the overall bond order is two. And lo and behold, this agrees with the Lewis structural representation. So O2 is interesting in that the net bond order does agree with the Lewis structure, but the Lewis structure does not really represent these unpaired electrons, which we'll see gives some interesting properties to the O2 molecule.